Hallo? Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for uh, coming to NYC Data Science Academy and for attending this meetup. Uh, John, Hank, and all of our guests, welcome. Uh, my name is Pranjali, and I work in the marketing team. Uh, and it's my pleasure on behalf of NYC Data Science Academy to welcome you all here. Uh, we are re really delighted here uh, to have you all uh, since this is a course demo of the, our deep learning course which is scheduled to run from October 19th to December 7th, all Saturdays from 11 to 5 p.m. And it's taught by John Cron, uh, who is also the author of Amazon's uh, number one position. It has number one position in several categories including uh, artificial intelligence and data mining. The name of the book is Deep Learning Illustrated and he, we'll be launching the book for the first time here. Uh, this is the book and a little bit about NYC Data Science Academy. We are an educational institution uh, for those who are new. Uh, this is, you know, we run uh, boot camps which are in person and online. Uh, we also have part-time courses, uh, corporate training and consulting uh, services. And we are ranked number one for the uh, in-person immersive data science bootcamp, which runs for about three months. And uh, we also have a specialized program in data um, analysis and visualization, machine learning, uh, intro to Python, R, and most importantly, deep learning, uh, which is scheduled uh, on October 19th. And we also organize a lot of meetups and info sessions. So feel free to check our website. Um, RSVP or get in touch with us, visit our website, grab a flyer or uh, you know, get in touch with our admissions officers if you need more information. And I know it's raining, you have traveled long distances to be here, so I don't want to waste any more time. I'll just quickly uh, introduce Hank and John and we'll get started in two minutes. Uh, so John is the chief data scientist at Untap which is a machine learning company and he's also a presenter of a popular series of tutorials on artificial neural networks and he's author of the deep learning illustrated book which was uh, which which he's launching today for the first time so this is a great opportunity and you're witnessing this Yay. Um, so this was released by Pearson um, early in um, August 2019, just a few days ago and just I think a week ago the physical copies are out and this is his first book signing event. Um, he also holds a doctorate degree in neuroscience from Oxford University and has been publishing um, on machine learning in leading academic journals since uh, 2010. He's a guest lecturer at Columbia University and um, has a lot of research. Uh, he has done a lot of research in this field. So, and a little bit about Hank, who will be presenting next. He had, uh, he is an alumni of the deep learning cohort and he'll be presenting his capstone projects. So, so enjoy, uh, brace yourself, challenge yourself, and uh, let us know if you have any more questions. Oh, one more thing. Uh, please make sure that you have signed in uh, on the iPad. We'll be raffling 10 uh, copies of Deep Learning Illustrated and John will be signing them as well. And we also have some NYC DSA swag, so uh, sign in and yeah. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Hank Yoon. A little bit about myself before I like to start on my project. Uh, I had been working at Wild Cornell University in their, um, their medical school as a research assistant in the pulmonary department uh, when I took the course with John. And currently I'm a online bootcamp student here at New York City Data Science Academy. I'm like halfway done, so I'm almost done. Ooh. Almost. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty hard, but okay. Um, so when I was working there, um, I was interested in deep learning of course, and I took the course, and I was able to do a little nice project with it, and I'm happy to show you guys what it's about. So um, for a raise of hands, how many of you guys know what genotyping is? Uh, quite a bit. So for those who don't know, genotyping is a way that scientists use to differentiate DNA 
uh, genetic, genetic differences within samples for experiments. So here's an example of what a genotyping sample would look like. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see what we would call a marker, which would be a reference for our samples. Um, you can see here the bands, and they start with the lowest and then go up in size. Um, we have two different samples that we were looking at in our lab, um, the wild type and the knockout. The wild type had a band around 300, whereas the knockout had around 400. And for our experiment, we were interested in the GLUT1 protein or the gene, and we, were, we suspect that it played a role in the development of lung fibrosis. And we wanted to see how, whether the gene affected the, um, the fibrosis. Um, I was actually interested in doing a project on this because John, in his uh, demo from last year, uh, audio. audio, I'm sorry. Uh, mm. just okay. Yeah. Yeah, talking about the in this data set, um, here's a great website that visualized the, the model behind the uh, recognition of handwritten uh, numbers. As you can see, if you input a, a one here, the model will be able to extract the features needed to guess what number it would be. So I figured I only have two bands in my uh, genotyping examples, so it should be fairly simple to for the model to predict whether it be a knockout or a, geno um, a knockout or a wild type. So that was the basis of my project. Yep. Okay, um, for those, when you guys do start your project, I think a major difference um, would be whether you create your own data set or to use a pre-made data set. Um, both have pros and cons, but I would suggest if you're new to use a pre-made data set because I probably spent around three weeks or five weeks making my own data set. So if you want to focus more on the theory of deep learning, I suggest to use a pre-made data set. Cons is not as sexy, but you do learn a lot more theory. Okay. Um, for the data structure, because I had to make my own data set, the sample size was relatively low. I had a trading set of about 48 a validation set of 15, a test set of five. Um, to compensate for this, I had to use some image augmentations. Um, John will talk about it more in the course, um, whether to tilt the image a little bit to create a new image, or whether to zoom out or to zoom in to create artificial images. Um, for creating the convolution of the neural network, um, I, I went pretty vanilla on the model. Uh, you can see here an example of what a CON2D will look like. Uh, it's a way to extract features from the image. I only had three. And for the activation function, to activate the neurons, um, ReLU, which is another common function. And for max tooling, uh, pooling a two by two, which is another, it's pretty all vanilla. And then this is my entire convolutional uh, neural network. It fits on one page, so it's not very complex, but it did do the job. Uh, you can see the three layers here, and then I added a little extra because it made the model look better, and then it worked better that way. And when I ran the model, I only did 10 epochs, but I figured it was enough to, for the accuracy to go up to 93%. So it started out as 50, pretty much a chance, and it was, all, it was able to go all the way to 93%. And when I ran the test, I was surprised that I was able to get four out of five correct. So it predicted that uh, of the five, four were knockouts, and um, the other one was a wild type. But unfortunately, I was kind of happy with my project, too. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, I can't hear very well. Could you repeat that? Yeah, the images. 
not the retention time, whether it would be different, it would, if it would be able to recognize between the knockout and the, geno, um, the wild type. Yeah, based on the size of where the location of the bands were. Any other questions? Yes? So what was your background when you started the book camp here? Uh, I, uh, it was the technical. I've, um, it was around, I've taken a course, a couple of courses here. So like a little bit of Python, a little bit of R, and then the course with John. So you already had technical skill before you, or you drove here? Yeah, in the boot camp, yeah. Yes? Yeah, so um, at the job, I was able to get images, and then from the images, I would, yeah, create them on my own. Yes? What was your class distribution like? Class distribution? It was just yeah. two. Well, whether it was knockout or the wild type. Right, but the distribution was 50 50? Yeah, 50 50. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. All right, can everybody hear me all the way to the back? Yes. Great. No mics necessary. Mm -hmm. All right, my name is John Crone, and I am uh, running this deep learning course that uh, runs parallel to this textbook, Deep Learning Illustrated, that, as Margella said at the beginning, was just released last week, and we're wrapping a bunch of these away, and we're going to assign them. We also have here in the audience, Grant Bailabelle, who is a co-author of the book. Um, and so he will be signing as well. Um, so very exciting to have us all here. <clears throat> so all these slides are available for download at johncrone.com slash talks. And you will see they are beautifully illustrated by the illustrator for a textbook named Anglin Bassins. So I, the lecture tonight is going to cover the 10 units of the deep learning course. We're going to spend the vast majority of our time tonight about half an hour in the very first unit where we're discussing the unreasonable effectiveness of deep learning so that tonight's lecture is just a general introduction to what deep learning is and why it's so widespread and amazing. Well, I'll also then briefly talk um, about the remaining units, so uh, explaining at a high level how deep learning works, how we build and train a deep learning network, what machine vision is, major application of deep learning, how we can apply deep learning to processing natural language and time series problems like financial problems. I'll also talk about the major deep learning libraries today, uh, TensorFlow 2.0. It's a uh, brand new library or a brand new major revision of the most popular deep learning library. It just came out last week and the vast majority of the time this course will be spent using that brand new TensorFlow 2.0 library. I'll also talk about PyTorch because as you'll see later on, it is a, it is a popular uh, library and I'll talk about why it's starting to become popular and why it's starting to take some of that market share away from TensorFlow. We'll talk about generative adversarial networks which are able to make deep fakes, um, compelling fake images, and deep reinforcement learning which is the closest thing we have to artificial intelligence today. Uh, my day job is working at Untap. The founder of Untap is sitting right here in the second row, Ed Donner. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, Ed has been encouraging Grant and me for years to be uh, studying deep learning models, making them more advanced, and building them into our clients' uh, systems. So, we build machine learning solutions to automate business processes, specifically we have a specialization, 
specialization in automating human resources related processes. So uh, Grant and I and Ed, frankly too, and the rest of our data science team, we build these deep learning algorithms to handle billions of documents uh, and impact uh, people all over the world uh, by building then around these deep learning algorithms user interfaces that are fun and easy for our clients to use. Uh, in addition to where I spend uh, most of my time uh, at Untapped, I also do publishing stuff for Pearson, so the, the textbook that just came out. Um, we do research uh, on a grant, uh, National Institutes of Health grant. We do machine vision research at Columbia University. Um, so that's our, our whole data science team does that at Columbia, building tools that automatically identify parts of infant brain images. And I also do a lot of online trainings in O'Reilly Safari. So yeah, so the book, Deep Learning Illustrated, there's my dog, Obo. Um, he was a big inspiration behind the book. Uh, and uh, a key thing that you might want to be aware of is if you go to this link, uh, bit.ly slash lowercase i, capital T, and then my last name, Chrome, um, you can click through and get 35% off of the book uh, if you, you know, use my last name during uh, checkout. So that's a pretty deep discount worth being aware of. There's a 40% off. There's a 40% off? so exciting about, uh, about deep learning today is how in demand it is. So here's a quote from The Economist last year saying that of the 10 most valuable quoting companies in the world, seven of those say that they have plans to put deep learning based AI at the heart of their operations. Here's a chart uh, up to December 2018 showing year over year the amount of funding, venture capital funding, going to artificial intelligence startups. And as you can see, there is a lot of it. So in 2018, uh, $18 billion of funding going into deep learning startups. And the reason why they're doing that is because around the globe, there are revenue forecasts that are expected to explode exponentially um, so that those valuations you know, in those startups are worthwhile. So, Definitely an exciting space to be in, both financially as well as socially. So I've taken um, a, a single summary figure here from a report from the McKinsey Global Institute showing a range of uh, social good domains from equality and inclusion, education, health and hunger, security and justice, crisis responses, economic empowerment, the public sector, the environment and infrastructure, and across all of those domains, various uh, AI capabilities, almost every single one of these rows, every single one of these AI capabilities, uh, from face detection, sentiment analysis, object localization, image classification, natural language processing, nearly every single one of these rows we cover in the Data Science Academy course that I offer. Um, so if you're interested not only in something that's in demand financially, but also doing something that has social benefit. Um, this report from McKinsey, uh, which I linked to in the slides, anything that has square brackets is an HTML link, and um, so you can read more about this from there. So despite all of this demand, there is a very narrow pipeline of talent to fill all of that demand. So according to this AI talent report, there are only 22,000 PhD educated uh, AI researchers globally. There are only a small portion of those, about 3,000, that are actually currently looking, and a very small number, 5,000, that are kind of this cream of the crop that are presenting at AI con conferences. So 
uh, it takes a long time to do a PhD in deep learning. It's a huge investment. So instead, my recommendation to become part of this talent pool is to uh, take a short course like this 30-hour course just over a few Saturdays. We provide all the same kinds of foundations uh, uh, in a hands-on way that you could get following this kind of academic approach. So let's introduce deep learning. I'm going to go through uh, the syllabus. And as I said, I'm going to focus mostly in the first unit right now, uh, because that's uh, the easiest part to convey in an introductory lecture on deep learning like this one. So our story starts with a trial bike. And I actually have a trial bike here in my bag, if I remember to pass it. Yes, I did. So this is a trial bike fossil from Morocco. And um, hey, pass that around. <laughs> Hopefully it makes its way back to me. I have no idea how valuable it is, but it's not one of the giveaways tonight. Um, so 540 million years ago, trilobites developed the ability to see. And that's this one happens to be myopic, and so it needed a prescription. Uh, uh, so developing the ability to see is a terrifically useful skill to have on this planet. Because if you can see, then at light speed, you can detect that there might be something that you'd like to eat in the distance. There might be something that would like to eat you in the distance. Or there's someone that you might like to mate with. And for any of those three reasons, um, vision all of a sudden made the trilobite um, have this kind of superpower relative to the other species on the planet. So in order to compete, in order to be able to eat a trilobite or avoid being eaten by a trilobite, there was this explosion in the, uh, in, in the species on our planet. It set up this kind of arms race between uh, various species 550 million years ago. So we went from, at the time of the trilobite, developing vision, having very few classes, very few genre of species on the planet, and from that point we all of a sudden had this explosion in, in speciation. So skipping ahead quite a bit, because this isn't a biology lecture, or particularly a vision lecture, but um, I talk about vision because the biological visual system is the inspiration for the way that deep learning systems work. So in the 1950s, researchers named Google and Wiesel were studying the, the mammalian brain, the most complex visual system in the known universe. And cat brains are quite a bit like human brains, but university research at the cores will let you do more things to cats than they will let you do to people. So Google and Wiesel were doing these experiments on cats. They implanted electrodes in the back of the cat's uh, brain in what we now today call the visual cortex. The reason why they picked that part of the brain is because they could see that anatomically there were lots of nerve fibers leading from the eyes to the back of the brain. So they put their recording electrodes there, which should fire, which should have lots of activity when those brain cells are in use. And then they showed the cats all kinds of visual stimuli. They tried showing them circles in various orientations. Um, nothing. No activity on their recording equipment. So they got frustrated. They jumped in front of the cats, waving their arms. No activity. They showed pin-up centerfolds to the cats. No activity. So after several days of absolutely no results, they were frustrated, and they took apart their equipment at the end of the day out of order. So typically, they would remove the cats from the recording equipment uh, before they started taking apart the projection equipment. But on this frustrated day, they started taking apart the, the projection equipment first. And like many of the great discoveries in history, from x-rays to penicillin, they made this serendipitous accidental discovery as they removed a slide from the recording equipment. The straight edge of the slide caused a big eruption and activity in the brain cells that they were recording from in the cat's skull. So their serendipitous discovery was that the first brain cells that receive 
uh, information from the eyes are attuned to detecting a straight line in a specific orientation, and only a straight line. So here are recordings from one particular cell that fires the most when it's receiving, uh, when it detects a straight line at a 45 degree angle. As you move away from 45 degrees, you see a marked decrease in the firing in that particular brain cell, such that as you get to horizontal or vertical, you don't see any firing at all. For the stats nerds out in the audience, you'll be pleased to know that this behavior follows a really nice normal distribution. Um, so there's a midpoint where the cell fires most, and as you move the straight line away from the ideal orientation, you get a normally shaped uh, decrease in activity. We still good for hearing me everywhere in here? Nice. Um, so, first they discover what they call these symbol cells. Those symbol cells that just detect straight lines. So let's say uh, our cat is looking at the head of the mouse then that first layer of brain cells is going, those simple cells, are going to detect straight lines in particular orientations. And of course, there's many thousands of them, so I just use an ellipsis here to denote that. <coughs> By the way, this figure, as well as any beautiful figure that you see in this presentation, was drawn by Agla Bassins for our book, Deep Money Illustrated. Um, any really terrible one was done by me. Um, you'll see some of those later on. So, Egley did an amazing job of portraying this uh, conceptual idea that I was trying to convey. And so, uh, so you have information, photons of light hitting the eye that represent this mouse. Those photons of light travel to that visual cortex of the brain. The first brain cells, these simple cells, to um, be processing this information are tuned to detect straight lines of particular orientations. Then there's another layer of brain cells, what Google and Bezel call complex cells, that can non-linearly recombine the information from the first layer, such that they can detect curves and corners. And then a layer after that can recombine the curves and corners into even more complex, more complex visual stimuli. And then through several more successive layers of increasing complexity, increasing abstraction, the brain is able to represent very complex visual ideas, like a mouse, a cat, a bird, or a dog. And so in this case, some particular pattern of neuron firing is going to cause straight lines to be recombined into curves, and more complex, more abstract visual representations until the, the cat's brain recognizes, hey, I'm looking at a mouse. So through several subsequent decades of research, doing brain imaging research, um, recording from uh, surgery patients if they're having brain surgery. We now have a detailed map of the way that the mammalian visual system works. So here is not a cat, but a person. And so we have here this V1 area. It's the first area to receive input from the eyes. This is where that very simple processing of straight lines and curves happens. And then as you move further and further away from that center point, from V1, the information encoded in these visual areas of the brain is increasingly complex, increasingly abstract. A really interesting example is this fusiform face area in humans, which is specifically tuned to detecting other human spaces. So very, very complex recombinations of the lower level simple features. All right, so that brings us to the end of our biology lesson today. So I have this biological vision track here in light blue starting with trilobites 543 million years ago. Now we've talked about Google and Beazle's research in the 1950s. Now we can jump over to talk about deep learning, which is this pink track here. And as I'm talking about deep learning, I'm going to use a counterpoint of what I call the traditional machine learning approach. So this includes techniques, other machine learning techniques like uh, regression models, support vector machines, random forests, and uh, one of the key ways that you can distinguish this traditional machine learning approach from the deep learning approach is that in the traditional machine learning approach, we might spend 
80 or 90 percent of our time coming up with uh, complex functions that we're able to pass over our raw data, whatever those raw data are. Uh, they could be pictures of faces, they could be uh, audio waveforms, and we have to uh, we have to develop an expertise in our raw data, and that might take many many years. Maybe a PhD in that particular area, and then we can extract meaningful uh, features, meaningful representations from our raw data with our functions, and then we pass the result of those functions into our model, whether that's a regression, support vector machine, random forest, what have you. With deep learning, this concept is turned on its head. With deep learning, we may not need to do any feature engineering at all. We may spend 10 or 20 percent of our time or 0 percent of our time engineering features because the deep learning models are able to extract those features automatically in a way analogous to the way the brain does. So the first deep learning architecture was called the Neocognitron. It was invented by a Japanese engineer named uh, Fukushima in 1980. And so here's a schematic of Fukushima's idea. Fukushima, as he was trying to build his machine vision system, he was reading biological research on how visual systems work. And in particular, he was reading a lot of Google and Diesel's research. And so he actually uses their terms in his papers. So he talks about simple cells, he talks about complex cells, and they serve an analogous function to those in the biological system. So if you put an input image into Fukushima's machine vision system, the first layer of that system is tuned to detect straight lines in that input image. And then the complex cell layer can recombine the straight line information from the first layer to represent curves and corners. And as we move deeper into the architecture, the representations become increasingly complex, increasingly abstract, until the final layer of the network can output a guess as to what the image is. Is this a cat, a bird, a dog, or so on? So that's 1980. Now let's jump ahead to 1998 with this architecture called the net pie. So in uh, 1998, a number of researchers, including eminent deep learning researchers like Yon LeCun, who's based at 770 Broadway uh, in the Facebook AI research group, um, and Joshua Bengio, who is at the University of Montreal. Um, at the time, they were working together in the 90s at at t Bell Labs. And they were tasked with a project by the United States Postal Service. There's lots of seats up at the front, by the way, if anyone Seats. There are many up here. Um, so, Lucuna and Benjio and their colleagues, they were tasked with this project to uh, be able to automatically recognize handwritten digits on the front of envelopes so that mail could be sorted automatically as opposed to manually. I always think of this as pretty interesting because it's interesting to me to think that up from whenever postal services were first invented, uh, centuries ago, up until the 1990s, every single piece of mail had to be sorted by a person. Armies of people sorting mail. But because of an algorithm, this deep learning algorithm in the 1990s, all of a sudden the mail could be sorted automatically, freeing up uh, human brain time for more creative, interesting tasks. Um, so here's a, a high-level schematic from our book about the way that this Lynette architecture works. You'll notice it's similar to the Fukushima idea. It just builds on Fukushima's ideas. So you pass in some input image here as a handwritten two. The first layer detects large, simple features in that handwritten two. And then as we move deeper into the Lynette 5 architecture, we have, um, we have smaller, more complex features of the image. So straight lines, curves and corners, even more complex uh, abstract features until the final layer has 10, 10 outputs, each that outputs a probability that any given input is one of the 10 possible digits. So in this case, when we input a handwritten two, the Lynette 5 architecture will say, hey, bing, there's a 95% chance this is a two, 
maybe a 5% chance it's an 8, and a 0% chance it's anything else. So here's actually a glimpse into what these artificial neurons in this deep learning system are tuned to detect. So um, you can see here, if you put in a number three, the artificial neurons, which uh, these artificial neurons are an algorithm that loosely mimics the way the biological brain cells work, and the exact inner workings of that um, of that artificial neuron um, equation. That's a big part of what we cover in the course, uh, in, in the opening lectures of the course. And you can see here that the artificial neurons in the first layer are tuned to detect straight lines around the edges of the image. And as we move deeper into the network, the representations of the number three become more complex, more abstract, until the final layer can help with, hey, I think this is number three. So how come, after this great application of deep learning in 1998, we weren't all using deep learning systems in the 2000s? How come it's only so recently that we're also all of a sudden interested in, in what deep learning is and all the applications that it has? Well, in the 2000s, there was a winter in deep learning research. And this winter was brought about, come up to the front, there's tons of space up here.
This is still today the largest public data set of images that people generally train their models on. So this image net data set that she created has 14 million images in it across 22,000 different categories. Shown here are some examples of those categories, as well as a algorithm's guess as to what these images are. So here's an image of a mite, and from the 22,000 categories that the algorithm is trained on, it says, hey, uh, I think there's about a 10% chance that this is a mite, a 3% chance it's a black widow, a 2% chance it's a cockroach, and so on. For this image, it says, hey, there's a 90% chance it's a container ship, a 10% chance it's a lifeboat, and so on. Now, every once in a while, it's a little bit tricky to say this is definitely one category or another. So here's a picture of a convertible's grill, and the algorithm says, hey, I think there's a 60% chance this is a convertible, but the right answer was grill. And so what they do to assess correctness is you only have to have, in this ImageNet competition that Bigbailey created, you only need to have your correct answer be in the top five. Um, so, for testing, she created this competition with a subset of the data, 1.4 million images that weren't available to the algorithms during training, and nobody knows what these images are, in fact. And those 1.4 million uh, images are spread across a thousand different classes of, of, of objects. And so you, here you can see the top five error rate. So, um, like I explained on the last slide, we're, we're allowing the algorithm to be, we're saying it's correct, as long as the correct answer is in the top five. And in 2010 and 2011, you can see that the algorithms had an error rate of around 50% on average. The best algorithms had an error rate of 30%. Uh, of so they're still getting one out of every three guesses wrong. 2011, very little improvement. And in 2012, the vast majority of the algorithms we're still at that 30% error rate. But there was one model that was entered into the competition that year that absolutely crushed every single other algorithm. And so there's a color code here. Traditional machine learning algorithms are coded in purple, and deep learning algorithms are coded in pink. So this first deep learning entrant in 2012 into the competition was absolutely crushed everything, and I'm going to show you uh, a little bit more about AlexNet on the next slide, and you can see that from thereafter, everybody switched to deep learning. There was no point in sticking with the traditional machine learning approach anymore. And so all of the algorithms thereafter were deep learning models, all the top algorithms, and an interesting threshold was reached in 2015 when these deep learning models surpassed human accuracy at this image classification task. So AlexNet was developed by um, Jeff Hinton and people on his team, Alex Kraszewski was the lead author. They were researchers at the University of Toronto at the time. And um, here you can see a glimpse of, of their architecture. So it's the same kinds of ideas as we saw in the biological brain. It's the same thing we saw with Fukushima doing in 1980. It's the same thing we saw with Yon Lakuin in 1998. We feed in an image at one end. The first layer of the architecture detects straight lines of particular orientations. So here are the 96 artificial neurons of that first layer, and, you, and what each of them is to detect, straight lines of particular orientations. The second layer detects curves and corners, subtle recombinations of the straight lines. By the third layer, the neurons are able to detect particular textures. By the fifth layer, it's special, the neurons specialize in detecting particular object parts. And then by the final layer, the complexity and the abstractness of the representations have become sufficiently abstract and complex that we can guess that we're looking at a grocery store or a ship or a rooster or a dining room table and so on. So the crazy thing about this that I want to underline is that those traditional machine learning models that they were competing against involved large teams doing decades of research to come up with all kinds of uh, subtle features uh, from the raw data, so, so manually engineering all these complex functions with lots of 
it helps statements to say, okay, if we find a dog's nose, then we want to start looking at different kinds of dog's faces, and if we want to be distinguishing Yorkshire Terriers from Great Danes, then we need to consider this part of the code over here. The deep learning model involved just three researchers who aren't machine vision specialists using this architecture, training it on the huge ImageNet data set that Big Baby created, and the architecture automatically learns the most pertinent parts of the images, the low-level features, the mid-level features, the high-level features that are required in order to perform the task that it was designed to, to perform. So this amazing property about deep learning models is that they can model any continuous relationship between some input and some output. You just need to set it up and train it appropriately. So since 2012, deep learning has made its way into everything. So we're not just talking about detecting a face in an image anymore. We're talking about detecting a particular face from amongst the billion users of Facebook. That uses a deep learning algorithm. To uh, detect pedestrians and stop signs and then uh, provide guidance on what um, actions a self-driving vehicle should be taking, this uses deep learning. In order to provide you with automated suggestions in Gmail, um, that's using deep learning. In fact, uh, Google in 2012 had no deep learning experts and zero products that involved deep learning. And today, Google has more than 300 products with deep learning embedded in it. And I can't imagine that they have much more than 300 products. Um, and then same thing, voice recognition. So whatever voice recognition device you use is using deep learning. And, that's, and it's deep learning that made tools like Siri go from being eh to wow, this really works. So let me just do one quick little demo so that you can see a neural network in real time. So there's this great thing called TensorFlow Playground, and during my course at the academy, we spend a lot of time playing around with this uh, tool because it provides a way that you can see uh, you can see what you're doing. You can understand how this network is learning. So, what we're doing in this demo is we have. We're trying to predict whether a dot is a blue dot or an orange dot based on its location on this grid. So you can see visually there's a pattern here, and we should be able to distinguish them. So here we have a very, very, very simple artificial neural network. It has one artificial neuron in what we call a single hip layer. So we have our input layer. In this case, we have two inputs. We have the horizontal and the vertical position of the dot. Those are the only two inputs. It's just a simple numeric value. That input flows through the single artificial neuron in a single hidden layer. And it flows into the output to make a prediction as to whether that, um, whether that point is an orange dot or a blue dot. With a single artificial neuron in our network, we can, the best we can do is fit a straight line to the data. However, by adding more artificial neurons into our architecture, three of them, we're able to draw a circle, well, a triangle, around the blue dots in the middle. And so now we have this clear boundary distinguishing orange dots from blue dots, and our model's working very well. Now, if we make the, comp the problem more complex, say this spiral plot problem, then we won't be able to solve it with our simple neural network with just one layer of neurons, but we can expand it to have, say, four layers and a bunch of neurons per layer. And now this should learn. Uh, 
One sec. I promise I can do it. So it's not solving it perfectly, but you can see roughly the idea. And so you can see even in this visualization, we have that same property from biological vision, from Fukushima in the 80s, Ledet in the 90s, Alex in 2012. We have this first layer that looks for simple straight line boundaries in the data. The second layer can recombine those curves and corners. Um, what you're seeing here visualized is tensors of information. Tensors are just uh, numerical arrays of data, and these tensors are flowing between artificial neurons in the network, which is where TensorFlow, the most popular deep learning library, gets its name. And so you can see the information, these tensors flowing through, and where there are thick lines, we have a particular artificial neuron that's taking advantage of straight lines to have particular curves and corners. Here we have more complex abstractions of those curves and corners, such that by the final layer of neurons, we're able to represent this complex spiral shape with our neural network. Whoop, keyboard's over here. So that's our kind of introduction at a high level to what deep learning is and how it's so incredible. Um, and we spent uh, the first morning of the course uh, getting into more detail about everything that I just covered. Um, in the afternoon of the first week of the course, we get into how deep learning works. So I mentioned earlier that each one of those artificial neurons is inspired by the way the biological brain cells work. So we spend a tiny little bit of time doing a biological neuroanatomy 101, discussing how biological brain cells work, and then going over the mathematics of how we represent these uh, approximately as artificial neurons. We also talk about uh, how we train our neural networks. So we, we learn about artificial neurons. We learn how to integrate them together into a network of artificial neurons. And then we learn how to train the network. So we have cost functions, which give us a sense of how wrong our network is. We, uh, we use gradient descent to find the lowest point in our cost, the part um, of the, you know, the, the configuration of our neural network where our network has its best possible performance. And uh, this is an illustration from the book. This is a trilobite, it's a blind trilobite. Um, and it's descending, it's, it's a gradient descent analogy that I don't have time to explain right here, but it's a blind trilobite on a hike finding its way to the valley of the lowest cost. Um, and we also spent time talking about backpropagation, which is a, uh, a deep learning specific learning technique that enables us to apply this gradient descent learning efficiently up and down all of the layers of our deep learning network. We talk about data sets for deep learning and so that you can take advantage of those. As Hank pointed out in his talk, where is Hank now? Left. Looks <laughs> like I've seen this garbage. Uh, well, in Hank's talk, he pointed out how you can have, you can either uh, use an existing data set in the course and then focus on theory. So I, so I provide lots of data sets so that you can do that. So you can take an existing data set and just spend your time on the course worrying about getting the theory right. Uh, the alternative is to be more uh, innovative like Hank and actually create your own data set, but that could be quite a lot of work. Um, yes, yeah, so we talk about machine vision data sets, natural language processing data sets, uh, finance data sets, and whether you end up taking my course or not, um, I recommend checking out geomprocom slash resources, where I have tons of uh, open data sources, particularly designed for deep learning machine learning projects. Um, and it's nice and curated, uh, and I'm constantly updating them with more resources. So at the end of the first week, I begin, I plant a seed in your brain and I get you to start ideating about what you might like to do for your own deep learning project. Uh, what data could you be using? Uh, what problem would you like to solve? How could you tackle that problem? In week two of the course, we start building and training a deep neural network. So a definition that I haven't given you is what a deep learning network is. 
and it's an artificial neural network with at least four hidden layers. So the, the final one I showed the demo there was a deep learning network. And as you start to build your networks deeper and deeper, you run into problems like the unstable gradient problem. I'll provide you with ways of resolving it. There are problems like overfitting to your training data. I'll provide you with ways of avoiding that. Uh, and we also talk about tools like TensorBoard, which allow you to visualize in real time how your network is training. Uh, we get into machine vision specific examples, so we talk about convolutional layers that power machine vision applications. We, so previously in the slides, all I've talked about is image classification problems, but we'll also talk about uh, object detection, where you detect particular um, objects in the image, and you say, here's a balloon, here's a balloon. We talk about uh, segmentation, where you identify the specific pixels in the image that represent the objects that you're looking at. And so uh, we'll build architectures together to detect objects in the images, to not just classify the whole image, but identify, hey, here in the image is likely to be a horse, here is likely to be a person. We use image segmentation to actually identify those objects down to a pixel level and say, here's one bike, here's another bike, here's a bike rider, here's another bike rider. Um, and we also use a really powerful technique called transfer learning that takes advantage of that huge image net data set so that we can use it and apply it to your own particular problem. So we transfer this huge weighty model that was uh, designed to solve the complex uh, image net problem and then we fine tune that to some particular machine vision problem that you might have. One of my previous students designed an algorithm that could detect chess pieces, uh, for example. Uh, and then we'll also talk about these brand new kinds of networks called capsule networks, which um, offer some advantages over all of the other kinds of deep learning models that are popular today. And the reason why, uh, so this is Jeff Hinton, who uh, was the inventor of AlexNet as well as capsule networks. And so one of the disadvantages of all of the popular uh, deep learning architectures today is that this space would be considered to be just as likely to be Jeff Hinton's space as this space. And so, Capsule networks are able to take advantage of relative positioning in a way that um, most popular deep learning networks, convolutional neural networks, don't today. All right, so then at the end of week two, we start formulating the specifics of your deep learning project together. In week three, it's all about um, sequences of information. So it's about natural language data, so whether it's words on a page or audio, the sound of my voice into your ears, or financial time series, sales predictions, all of these are examples of data flowing in one dimension over time. And so we talk about specific techniques. Much like in machine vision, the neural network, the deep learning approaches to, to natural language problems like machine translation problems, uh, neural networks greatly outperform the traditional machine learning approaches shown in red here, and so those deep learning approaches shown in blue approach human expert uh, quality in a lot of these kinds of tasks, uh, natural language tasks. Uh, to, to, in order to do this, we make use of something called word vectors, which we spent a lot of time in the course describing, as well as recurrent neural networks that you may have heard of, so where our machine vision architecture, have that linear architecture from input to output, with recurrent neural networks, we're able to loop our neural network over a sequence of words, such as John and Grant are enjoying writing a book together, which was this demo sentence. And um, we talk about long short-term memory units, which are a particular, particularly powerful <coughs> type of recurrent neural network that can solve very complicated um, time series problems. At the end of week three, we begin to start assessing our deep learning projects and benchmarking them against existing standards. In week four, uh, we begin our advanced units where we talk about advanced TensorFlow. So um, up until this point in the course, in the first three weeks of the course, we use the, so TensorFlow 2.0 was released two days ago. We will be using TensorFlow 2.0 in the course. The default way of building your neural network graphs in TensorFlow 2 is to use what we call Keras layers. 
K-E-R-A-S. And Keras layers make building TensorFlow models very, very easy, as you'll see in those first three weeks. But they abstract away a lot of what's going on under the covers. So in week four, we get into low-level TensorFlow graphs so that we can understand this is the fundamental equation of artificial neurons, W dot X plus B, and we learn how to code that up in low-level TensorFlow and network this low-level graph together at a matrix level. So we actually look at a matrix of inputs, we look at a matrix of weights, we look at a matrix of biases, and we figure out how to link all these elements together in order to build and train um, and, and understand deep learning models better, more intimately. And this allows you with infinite flexibility on how your deep learning models might work. We will also use the PyTorch library in that week. So this is a brand new part of my course. I've never offered PyTorch in this uh, academy course before, but I've started to need to because it's increasing in popularity. So shown here in red is how popular TensorFlow is in terms of um, internet searches. Keras is shown in gold. PyTorch is here in green. And the next most popular library is MXNet and CNTK are down here in, in blue and purple. So you can see clearly there are three libraries that are worth knowing uh, and that are very popular today. And you can also see that just this year, PyTorch has begun to eat into TensorFlow's share of searches. And so PyTorch is, is so we'll talk a lot about why you might use PyTorch instead of TensorFlow Keras. And the other great thing about it is that it allows you, it gives you another tool in your kit so that you can be, uh, you can, so whatever, pretty much anywhere you go, whether you're talking about academically or uh, in, in industry, deep learning practitioners are gonna be using one of these three libraries. They're gonna be familiar, familiar with one of these three libraries. And so by covering PyTorch, we ground out your exposure to all of the popular libraries today, and we also give you another way of thinking about deep learning problems, because PyTorch tackles the building and training of deep learning models in a way that's different from TensorFlow and Keras. And so again, this gives you a more complete image of how deep learning works. At the end of week four, we talk about specific strategies for improving your models, like tuning hyperparameters and changing your model architectures in different ways. And then in week five, we get into the really fun stuff. So in unit nine, we talk about generative adversarial networks, which are capable of performing these deep fakes and style transfer, so that you can take a photograph and style and turn it into the style of Claude Monet or Van Gogh or, and so on. You can change Monet into photos, you can change zebras into horses, summer into winter, and so on. Um, and they've started to become really, really good. There's this fun website called Which Face is Real that has some good fakes. So every single time it generates a new comparison, let's take a vote. Uh, is the image on the left real? No. no. <laughs> okay, is the image on the right real? Raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. Okay, people definitely think it's the image on the right. And they are correct. So the way that I've started to be able to figure out these is artifacts in the background. So although, at least in this particular user interface, in this particular web tool, the faces are pretty compelling, you often see weird like amoebas like floating around in the background with the fake images. Let's just do one more. Oh, that's a pretty good one. But same thing you could tell. There's no like amoeba, amoeba weirdness back here, but there is back here, so obviously this is the real one. But anyway, the fakes are getting pretty good. Um, So this is the final demo. I just have this quick one. There's this uh, tool called Quick Draw Online where you try to draw, it's like Pictionary, against a convolutional neural network that guesses what you're drawing. So you say, it asks you to draw a bucket, okay? So you try to draw a bucket and it has, it has guesses happening here at the bottom and I bet if I put a handle on it, it's a bucket. So, 
draw pants. Yeah, easy. Some of these are pretty easy, some of them are harder. So those two drawings that I just made are, have been now added to the world's largest doodle data set of 50 million doodles. So what we do in the course is you can pick an, uh, a, a class uh, of these images, say apples or beds or beards or whatever you want, and have a generative adversarial network create these sketches. And something that uh, we do in, in, in this course for the first time is we used to, I used to have you do all of the demos on your laptop, but this kind of stuff, using a generative adversarial network to build sketches, it doesn't work in real time on your laptop. It would take hours or days. And so for the first time, something new that I'm doing in the, in the academy course for the first time is using Google Colab, where you get free access to GPUs in the cloud, and you can be building uh, generative adversarial networks that are creating fake sketches in minutes. So that's a cool, so we'll do all of the demos in the course in Colab. Um, so yeah, as an example, well this one didn't turn out because uh, they didn't have Adobe Reader on this computer. So it would go through and show you um, as it trains, but I do have, I can show you what it looks like. Deep Learning Illustrated, go to the website, go to the GitHub profile, and we do have the notebook. Uh, whoops, not that one. Generative adversarial network. And Grant did the vast majority of the work on this one. Uh, and at the bottom of the notebook, so in this case, the training data set is 150,000 hand drawn apples from that data set. And the network learns how to draw apples. So in the beginning, it just has some low level simple features, but then they start to form together to what kind of look loosely like apples. And as the model trains, it gets better and better and better until after 2,000 rounds of training, how about them apples? Uh, this, whole, this whole presentation has been leading up to that one gimmick. Um, I lost my uh, preview, oh there it is. Okay, so and then the final unit, we talk about deep reinforcement learning, which is the closest thing that we have to artificial intelligence today. It's the kind of thing that powers um, the Go algorithms that are able to defeat the world's best Go players. So Go is this board game that requires a lot of intuition and complexity. Um, and people thought it was going to be decades before we had a computer that could beat the world's best Go players. If you want to see an amazing movie, documentary, that's available on Netflix, it's called AlphaGo, and it's a documentary about the algorithm that was built for this match, and then the human drama around this match. And I won't ruin the end of the film for you, um, but so we, we get deep into these kinds of complex algorithms that today are being used in complex games, self-driving cars, and we'll talk about the theory and we will build an algorithm that is capable of playing video games uh, as the final demo of the course. Uh, there will also be, you will optionally have the opportunity, um, so by the way, um, everyone that takes my course is an adult, all of you are adults, I don't babysit you. Um, in order to pass the course, all you really have to do is show up and be able to speak competently about the fundamentals of neural networks. However, in order to make the most of the course, I highly recommend that you do do a project. And those of you who feel uh, excited about the project that they've created, you're welcome to present on the final day. And so every cohort that I have, we have more and more students that take the opportunity. For the last cohort, there were about eight students that presented just do a quick five, 10 minute presentation, much like Hanks at the beginning of this lecture. Um, on what you did, and uh, yeah, it's yeah, great opportunity for feedback and um, kind of gives you a nice final ending to the course. So why is all of this so exciting? It's so exciting to be pursuing deep learning and studying these things because at the beginning of this lecture I showed those charts on how much uh, financial interest there is in deep learning, how much social good there can be had from deep learning, but 
the AI revolution actually hasn't even begun. We're at the starting point today. So you have the opportunity to be getting in at the ground level. So think back to our myopic trilobite that developed its early visual system um, 550 million years ago. It took millions of years for the visual system to evolve from that primitive trilobite visual system <coughs> to the complex, full-color, face-detecting visual systems that you and I have. In contrast, machines were able to go from a biological inspiration in 1980 to exceeding <laughs> human performance on admittedly narrowly defined, narrowly defined machine vision tasks by 2015. So this process that took millions of years for the biological world happened in decades in machine vision. So this is being powered by things like the amount of data doubling on the planet every 18 months, processing power cost halving every two years, cheap sensors with the Internet of Things, it's going, they're going to begin to appear <coughs> everywhere. We're going to have trillions of sensors on the planet a decade from now. All of them generating data that can be fed into machine learning models. And because of tools like GitHub and Stack Overflow and archive journals, we have deep learning techniques that are refined in academia and in industry shared at light speed all over the globe. So us as humans, we're going to be, we're kind of right now standing at our human intelligence uh, station and you see me doing a presentation like this and I'm like, you know, computers are getting pretty good at playing board games and video games. We're kind of looking at um, machines in the distance and AI kind of arriving slowly. But as it picks up steam, we're all of a sudden going to be realizing that it's coming at us fast until it blows right past us. And so it's kind of this exponential growth curve in computing that's happening right now. And we're starting to approach the level of complexity of insect brains with our um, algorithms. And so uh, while human performance increases gradually and linearly, computer performance is increasing exponentially. And we're sitting right here at this point in history as those lines overlap. So expert AI people predict that we will have artificial general intelligence by 2040. That's a al single algorithm that can outcompete an average human at any task that an average human can do. And they predict that we'll have artificial super intelligence, which is greater, uh, a, a, a single algorithm that can outperform any group of humans um, on any kind of task. And well, we have no idea what that's going to mean for us. Uh, but one way or another, it seems like you and I are standing here on this precipice of um, technological progress that is about to take off. And you can be a part of it in this course. Or, uh, so it runs October 19th, October 26th, November 26th, November 23rd, December 7th. It's all Saturdays. Um, there's a 10% discount code here, but I think Pranjali has a 15% one. Um, so much like me being out on all the flyers out here, there's better discount codes that Pranjali can give you. And yeah, there's the one for the book that is now out of date. Use the one on the flyers. Um, yeah, that's the end. Questions? Of uh, deep learning libraries, including PyTorch and MXNet and Cafe and all these other libraries. 
It's just, a, it's just an API definition standard. But it's most popularly coupled with TensorFlow. And so with TensorFlow 2.0, this new release, the recommended way of building anything simple that you want to do is to use uh, those Keras layers. But then you can trivially, um, this slide makes more sense, this is the final slide. Uh, but then you can trivially dive deeper into the inner workings of matrix level TensorFlow, TensorFlow by doing what they call subclassing. So you can take the existing classes and then adjust them to suit your needs. So you can build custom cost functions, custom training loops, custom layers, custom activation functions, um, custom blocks of layers. Uh, the world is your oyster all of a sudden. PyTorch um, can also interact with the TensorFlow ecosystem via another open standard called Onyx, O-N-N-X. So that's a way of storing your libraries in a kind of open format. It's the Open Neural Network Exchange, I think, is what ONNX stands for. And so it allows you to store your deep learning model from PyTorch into this Onyx, and then you can transfer it to TensorFlow or vice versa. Great question. Yes, sir. What do you think is the future for data scientists for things like AutoML, places like H2OAI, Great question. So the question is, uh, what do you think about the future of data science with tools like AutoML and H2O.AI? So in the same way that Keras layers abstract away some of the complexity of building technical models, other tools like AutoML or H2O.AI, uh, again, add, uh, take, they add another layer of, um, of of complexity of abstraction on top of, say, using Keras layers to build deep learning models. So with those kinds of tools like AutoML, auto H2O.AI, you can have your um, the aspects of your model, how many layers should it have, uh, how many uh, rounds of training should I use, uh, how should I split my training data set. All these kinds of things can be configured by these kinds of tools. However, there are limitations. So in the same way that using Keras layers instead of using low-level TensorFlow, abstracts away some of the complexity, it also handcuffs you. It prevents you from being able to do more things. In the same way, using these other high-level tools, these AutoML tools, handcuff you to, um, to a particular way of, of, of solving these problems. And they're also hugely computationally intensive because they, um, they search over such a vast hyperparameter optimization space. And so, um, these kinds of tools, they have the potential to make you a better data scientist if you use them properly, but they also have the potential to make you a worse data scientist. And the future of data science is not going to be diminished by the development of these tools. It will only be improved because the complexity uh, in solving these problems effectively isn't to do with experimenting with a lot of different model architectures. It's to do with being uh, with understanding how to build pipelines efficiently with your data and about um, solving problems in clever ways as opposed to just relying on a search over a large hyperparameter space. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Do you have any comments on the interpretability of the results? It seems like you're getting good results, but how do you interpret them or know what's going on? Great question. So the question is about interpretability of results. So with, if you were to, for example, use a linear regression model to solve a given problem, you get a specific beta weight that allows you to say, OK, I know exactly how much every single one of my predictors in my model impacts my outcome. With a deep learning model, you could have millions or billions of artificial neurons that act in some complex way that you can't determine uh, at a glance. However, tools do exist for probing into how the black box of deep learning works. Um, so Jason Yasinski has built a popular deep viz toolbox that allows you to visualize many of the visualizations that I showed on these slides of uh, what particular artificial neurons we're seeing. This allows you to dive into how the deep learning network is making its decisions. In particular, you need to be mindful that your algorithm isn't, un isn't introducing some kind of undue bias, which is something that we spend a fair bit of time in the course talking about, and actually our company untapped uh, has a particular specialization in because we're in human resources, so removing bias from algorithms and keeping an eye on bias is a big part of what we do, um, and something that we have, for example. Great question. Yes, sir. Have you seen any uh, deep learning research uh, focusing on coding actions as opposed to just subjects, like S specifically within SVO, subjects for a broader object? Uh, so you're talking about uh, 
uh, uh, like uh, predicting parts of a sentence. Predicting an action. Oh yeah, predicting an action. Yeah, so I mean, so for example, um, there are deep learning models that exist that can take in uh, video as an input to use convolutional layers to take in your video as an input, and then you have a training data set that consists of labeled aspects of the video. So you have, as a baseball is being thrown in the in the video, um, that is the, in the training data set, that has been annotated as saying a baseball is being thrown. Through a large enough training data set, that convolutional neural network of videos coming in one end and language being predicted at the other end by a recurrent neural network over here, you can train the network to be able to do that kind of prediction on videos that it hasn't seen before. So yes, absolutely. All right, so Prangeli's waving at me, um, and she's not just waving hi, she's waving um, that she's turning the lights on. <laughs>